I want to share a short message from Psalm 32. And uh, I've entitled it, Happiness is Being Forgiven. We very often focus on forgiving others, and rightly so. Uh, The Bible encourages us to do that time and time and time again, as many times as is necessary. But today, we're going to echo, echo the sentiments of David in Psalm 32 when he praises the Lord for being forgiven, forgiving him. And um, this came to mind when I saw a bumper sticker. Now, this wasn't the real bumper sticker. But years ago, there was a bumper sticker that said, happiness is being forgiven and appropriating that truth. In other words, grasping the truth of that. That happiness is being forgiven. I'm not a car aficionado, but I think that's... What is that? That's an old... Mustang, isn't it? Yeah. But I have to admit that um, these computer tools today allow us to do some interesting things, even to the extent of tilting the words when we put them on there. So we added the bumper sticker, okay? There was another thing I was reading that just really grabbed my attention. It was a quote from Marganita Lasky. Now, you don't know her, and I don't. But she was a uh, journalist, and uh, she was also a playwright and a novelist. And you've heard about the Oxford Dictionary of the English Language, that big, fat tome. Well... This lady is said to have contributed 250,000 definitions to that dictionary. So she was very literate, wouldn't you say? (laughs) And she said something that I just can't get out of my mind. Near her death in 1988, she said this. What I envy most about you Christians, and she was not one. She was an avowed atheist. But she says, what I envy most about you Christians is what? Your forgiveness. I have nobody to forgive me. I hope none of us can say in truth what Marganita Lasky said. I hope all of us can feel there is indeed someone who can forgive us. Psalm 32, verses 1 and 2, Blessed is he whose transgression is what? Forgiven. Whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute, what? Iniquity. And in whose spirit there is no deceit. In this passage, David uses three distinct words for sin. The first is the word transgression. If you look at the original language, you discover that it can best be translated as rebellion or revolt. To transgress is to rebel, to openly rebel. The second word for sin is indeed what? Sin which implies, in the original language, missing the mark 
or not meeting God's holy standard. And then there's a third word, iniquity. Iniquity. And that has to do with a conscious, deliberate, intentional offense against God's law and the guilt that is associated with that decision on our part. Likewise, in the same text, and as you can see, the text is literally loaded with concepts, Likewise, in the same text, David uses three words for forgiveness. The first is forgiven, and it comes from a Hebrew word which means to lift or to carry or to take. In other words, when you are forgiven, the burden of sin is removed. Someone takes it. Someone carries it. The second is the word covered. Covered. Whose sin is covered. Which means to conceal or to hide. And the Bible talks about casting sins where? In the depths of the sea. So far away they're concealed, hidden. You you can't possibly see them. It suggests the image of our sin being forever hidden from God's sight. Third, third is the notion of not imputing sin, which comes from the Hebrew word to reckon, that word impute, to reckon, to count something as belonging to a person. David says the Lord will not reckon our forgiven sins as belonging to us any longer. Instead, he imputes or reckons just the opposite. He imputes righteousness and that by faith. The three words that you see there for sin, accompanied by the three words that you see in that text for forgiveness, They would seem to indicate that the totality of our sin, everything about our sin, from every angle, any type of sin, is fully countered by the totality of God's forgiveness. And this is only by the grace of God, not by anything we can do, not by any merit of our own. It is in response to confession, to repentance, and it is in response to a genuine repentance. As David indicates there in the last line, and he describes sin in its various forms. He describes forgiveness in its various forms. And then he says, and, and in whose spirit there is no, what? Deceit. David is emphasizing here the futility. The futility of faking true confession and repentance. Don't ever think you can bluff or fool God in this regard. We can only receive God's forgiveness in its various forms when our confession and repentance are unequivocally genuine. When we hold absolutely nothing back. 
As I think about those thoughts, it comes to me that isn't forgiveness wonderful? Isn't being forgiven wonderful? It's like being set free from a great and terrible weight. And David understood that. He understood what it was like to bear the burden of sin and moral failure and how happiness was hindered when he tried to hide his sins. Look at the next verse or two. When I kept silent, my bones grew old through my groaning all the day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer. Pretty descriptive, I would say. Notice how David experienced both emotional groaning and physical effects. Says his bones grew old. That's kind of how my bones are feeling lately. And it happened to him because he was harboring unconfessed sin. He further says that he was continually plagued. How do I know? Well, continually, day and night sounds pretty continual to me. And that he experienced these debilitating effects as a result of God's discipline in his life. Notice there, your hand was heavy upon me. He recognized that God was using his circumstances to teach him some important lessons. And by the way, I'm going to take a quick little side trip here. If you're reading from the King James Version, you'll notice that after some of the verses is the word S-E-L-A-H. I'm not perfect about translating it or or pronouncing it, let's put it that way. Scholars have long wondered exactly what that means. You would think that the scholars of the original language would have it all figured out, but they don't. They disagree on that word. What's it sitting there for? Well, it occurs 71 times in 39 of the Psalms. And it occurs three times in the book of Habakkuk in chapter 3. And that makes 74 times in the Bible. And so I wanted to find out what it meant. And nobody knew. But there is one plausible suggestion that scholars seem to be gravitating around. And it is this that it may indicate a break in the song. Now remember, these are songs where it appears. Songs, psalms. And it indicate, may indicate a break in the song whose purpose is similar to that of saying, Amen. Amen. So be it. His thoughts here as David thought them, as David wrote them, he's saying, wow, so be it. (laughs) That's a powerful thought. It stresses the truth and importance of the preceding passage. And if you were to look at uh, original Semitic and Arabic languages, I don't read them, (laughs) but I know how to use some reference tools. In there, it suggests that it means valid or logical or truth-preserving or honest or righteous. In other words, one commentator views the word colloquially as meaning this. Listen up. Pay attention. This is important. That's important. That's important. If you want true happiness. You see, when we try to suppress our guilt, 
It eats away at us on the inside. It can even make us physically ill, sapping our vitality, David says. And though we may keep it at bay for a little while, our guilt always and inevitably catches up with us. So, it's better to face it sooner rather than later. And notice that in this text, David repeats... Now, got to get the next text. There we go. Repeats the three words for sin. I acknowledged my sin and my iniquity. And I said, I will confess my transgressions. But notice something else here. It seems like everything in this passage comes in threes. He offers three words for confession or contrition. First, he says, I acknowledge. I acknowledge. The root word has to do with knowing. And here David is saying, I believe, I grasp what I've done. I now understand something of its magnitude. And I want to let you, Lord, know that I know. That's what confession is about. Second, he then says, My iniquity I have not hidden or covered, or concealed. Now, earlier, David spoke of the Lord covering his sins. That was the previous text. He seems to be saying here that as long as he, David, covered his sins, he could not experience the thrill of knowing that God had covered his sins. And third, David had a conversation with himself. Have you ever done that? (laughs) I said, (laughs) I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. In other words, he was determined. He was firm in his decision. It was not a decision of impulse. He understood that the Lord is pleased with a determined and contrite heart. Our sin can never be hidden from the Lord anyway. So we're only fooling ourselves when we try. And the best thing is to bring it out in the open before Him. It's not pleasant, it's not pretty. It's necessary. It's necessary. Sin is something like a boil that must be lanced before there can be healing. And God is, after all, the great physician, and there's nothing you or I could ever do that he has not dealt with before. In fact, he's already dealt with all of our sins when Jesus took them, carried them to the cross. It is on this basis, then, that the last phrase comes clear. And you forgave the iniquity of my sin. I acknowledged. I'm not hiding anymore. I'm confessing. I understand how I've hurt you. 
and you forgave. I don't think it's accidental that that phrase is part of this verse. He could have waited three or four or five more verses and slipped it in there. The Lord forgave me. I would believe that because it's here, David felt at that point that God's forgiveness was instantaneous, immediate. Don't have to wait for it. The truth is that forgiveness always costs the one who forgives. Jesus paid that enormous price for us, and that is why the Apostle John could confidently say, if we what? Confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. There's just one more thing to notice in Psalm 32, 5. You forgave, whoops, I want to go back. How do I do that here, Jerry? There we go. You forgave the what? Iniquity of my sin. Iniquity of my sin. The Lord not only gave this forgiveness immediately, but if you read verses 6 to 10, which we won't do today, if you read verses 6 to 10 when you get home, you're going to discover that David learned very quickly there are attendant blessings extended by the Lord when we are forgiven. He not only forgives, he bestows additional blessings. Talks about not being affected by floodwaters. <laughs> it talks about preservation from trouble. It talks about being surrounded by songs of deliverance. A song in your heart. It talks about, uh, oh, so many things. It talks about the fact that the Lord will instruct us and teach us and guide us. It talks about mercy being all around us. Read those texts sometime. Talk about wonderful blessings that come in forgiveness's train when the Lord forgives. There's still more. In Jesus Christ, not only are we cleansed of all unrighteousness, but we also receive the righteousness of God himself. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become what? the righteousness of God in him. A great exchange has taken place. God no longer imputes sin to our account. He gives us his righteousness instead. We receive this righteousness by faith in Jesus Christ. And if you're looking for something to really say Selah about, that's it. Amen. Even David, though he lived hundreds of years before Jesus came, was forgiven and declared righteous on the basis of what Jesus did on the cross. Because God is not bound by time. When David confessed his sin to the Lord, God saw Jesus nailing that same sin to the cross. And when David finally confessed his sin, he discovered the great happiness of being forgiven, and he closed his song with these words, Be glad in the Lord and what? Rejoice, you righteous. Notice there, righteousness is imputed to us. You righteous. And shout for joy, all you upright 
in heart. This language is wonderful and exuberant beyond belief. In the original language, in fact, when it talks about being glad, the word could be translated lighthearted. Wouldn't you like that? Lighthearted. Those heavy burdens are gone. The word for rejoice. The word for rejoice means to spin around, to whirl and twirl for joy. I'm not going to attempt that this morning. I would like to. <laughs> I would like to demonstrate. Maybe I ought to have you all stand and demonstrate. <laughs> and the phrase shout for joy, <laughs> well, the original language means just that, shout for joy. The happiness of being forgiven, to know that God is not angry at you, that God is not vengeful toward you, that you stand before him in his righteousness, fully and forever forgiven. And that is what our communion service today is all about. The happiness that comes from being forgiven and sharing that forgiveness with others. In both the ordinance of humility and the ordinance of the Lord's Supper, I invite you to focus on Jesus as servant and Jesus as Savior. You will find him here in what we do in the next few minutes if you seek him with all your heart. Please leave aside any chaos in your life. Let him carry those burdens for you. Ask him to strengthen your faith, your conviction, your determination to come clean with him, to confess, to repent, to appropriate his forgiveness, the forgiveness he offers, and then to forgive others as he has forgiven you. Claim his sacrifice on your behalf, his remarkable gift of grace, and if you do, he will grant you joy, peace, and yes, happiness. Seventh-day Adventists practice what is known as open communion. And if you are a visitor with us today and have accepted Jesus' gift of salvation... You are invited to participate in any and all portions of this service with which you feel comfortable. Among the Lord's invitations to us during this time is an invitation to look around, to consider our relationships with one another, how we might support one another, how no one of us is more important or more deserving of God's grace than another. With that in mind, I invite you to read responsively with me from John 13. The words are on the screen. I will read the light gray print. You read with me on the yellow print. And if it's a challenge to read the screen, it is number 772 in your hymnal. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water in a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Then he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What I am doing you do not understand now, 
but you will know after this. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, He who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew who would betray him. Therefore he said, You are not all clean. So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments, and sat down again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. We will separate now for foot washing. The men will meet in the front left corner of the fellowship hall. Couples are furthest back in the fellowship hall. And women can meet in the primary children's classroom on the right. We encourage you to stay with your group until everyone is finished. And I want to invite you maybe to gather in a circle. And someone can lead in singing a chorus. Uh, perhaps having a final prayer together. And then you can return to the sanctuary. Let's be dismissed at this time.